ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rebels and Flux. My name is Chris Netto. I am your host today. I am happy to say that I am joined by one of the coolest guys on the internet, CI40 under 40 winner, SEN the nines winner. The list goes on. This guy's young, he's hot, and he is doing things in AV that you guys should find out a little bit about. Chase McLeod, how are you, sir? Uh, doing good, Chris. How you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great, man. I um, Let's set up why I gave you that really grand entrance here. I've known Chase now <laughs> for a while because I... Most of the people I brought on the Rebels thing have, uh, we've connected online, we have shared uh, content, we've actually exchanged ideas and stuff like that. We've actually met in person a couple of times. Yeah. You, sir, work for a company down in Louisiana. Can you please give us the information? I know you're a senior AV technician. Give us your company's information. Uh, yeah, so I work for a company called Interstate Electronic Systems. Um, I've been working with these guys for about five years now. They've been around, actually the company itself, it's an interesting history, have been around since the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, since the inception, I believe they started as a uh, school supply company and kind of migrated into electronics and have you know morphed over the years. And then in its current state, it was about uh, 2002, 2003, I believe they formed as Interstate Electronics. Um, so before my days of even entering the AV industry, but, uh, yeah, I work with a really great group of people. Uh, we're continuously growing. I mean, the five years I've been here, I've seen some exponential growth in just the uh, projects that we're working on, the scope of projects that we're working on. And uh, But yeah, we're a design build integration firm. Um, we work in all different types of markets. So uh, lots of higher education, lots of command and control. Um, we do unique things. We've done some really, really cool. We had a really great opportunity last year to commission and design took about two years to design and put in a, a really massive 20 projector blend for a very uh, special um, river study project for the state of Louisiana. So the uh, coastal protection restoration authority that kind of monitors the, the coastline Louisiana and how it helps restore it did a really good projection mapping project for them to help them uh, with some research and free museum type aspect. Um, yeah. I saw that project really cool. If you guys don't know the project that he's referring to, it was covered by the, the, the AV trade mags, where basically it was a 3D printed floor with the actual textures of what a map or what the elevations would be. And what Chase and his company did was then projector map onto that, adding the moving water, the greenery, and then switch that to the different elevations to show how erosion was happening. Great use of modeling uh, and mapping combination. Uh, typically something we've seen at an infocom on a very smaller scale, but this was the size of a warehouse. I mean, this was like half a football field size. Am I correct? Yeah. The projection actual surface was uh, 90 feet by 120 feet. So pretty massive size. Um, it was a really great partnership between us and Christy digital. Um, you know, it was a long road getting up to it and getting through it, but it was uh, really great all around. And in the end, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal project to be a part of. Awesome. That's a great use of projector mapping. A lot of people just think of projector mapping as being done on the sides of buildings, which is great because that adds a wow factor to what we do uh, as an industry. Obviously, uh, it's a great promotional vehicle for AV. Like, hey, listen, look, it's Britney Spears on the side of a hotel. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it doesn't do much for her her uh, residency. I think she showed her, we showed her on the side of a building and then she kind of flaked out. <laughs> no, thank you. So you the Madden curse, maybe. What's that? It's kind of like the Madden curse. Yeah, exactly. You don't show your your, your face on the side of a building and uh, announce a residency. <laughs> yeah. Apparently you go down. So it's funny you bring up Madden because there's a picture that floats around the internet. If I can find it, I'll add it, but I doubt I'll be able to find it. There's a picture of you sitting on a couch, kind of doing a couch potato -y thing from years ago, pre Chase McCloud, uh, family guy, uh, playing a video game, you oh, know, where you claimed oh. yourself to be a gamer. Uh, is oh, this true? Uh, what kind of gamer are oh, you? Oh, no, I was, I was totally lying. No, I'm not a gamer <laughs> at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got uh, you. I'll tell you this. No, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the <laughs> PS2 that I owned in that picture, yep. the PS2 that I still have today, that's how much of a gamer I am. I played Tony Hawk, any version of Tony Hawk they had, and that's about it. That's the extent. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, obviously I had – Nintendo 64, Super Nintendo. So I played as a kid growing up, but never, never in, uh, grew into being a gamer at all. So a full fledged gamer. That's great. I love the the picture <laughs> was set up. It looked like, dude, this guy's been gaming since he was like twelve. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> what were you like sixteen in that picture? I uh, actually I was uh, I believe eighteen. That was actually that picture is 
post Katrina, probably two months after Hurricane Katrina hit, um, I was living, I, I lived outside of the house. I moved out for college, lived with some friends right by UNO and the house that we were living in got, uh, I think like 11 and a half, 12 feet of water and it sat for about a month, sat for about a month underwater. So that house was obliterated and basically like my, fr- my freedom of living out of the house became, hey, move back in with mom and dad until you figure out what the next step is. So I moved back to my parents' house and that period of time for about six to nine months, maybe even a year post Katrina, nobody, you know, our jobs were closed. I was working at a restaurant at the time. Tourism wasn't back up. So everyone was gutting houses and just basically making cash money to rip people's stuff out of their house and get rid of nasty fridges that have been sitting for months. So that's all I was doing. Basically, I would go and gut houses all day and then go back to my parents' house and play video games and hang out at the house because there was people were scattered to the wind around the country. You didn't know where anybody was at and it took a while to kind of recoup everything. So yeah, we I was kind of forget the New Orleans. We kind of yeah. forget that New Orleans went through a, uh, a little bit of a, of a disaster back then. And to yeah. hear that somebody was actually affected, you know, I know people that were affected uh, prior to us uh, uh, going on air. I, I was saying that I have a friend of mine that uh, works and lives in New Orleans and his whole family had to relocate and they relocated out to Houston because he was working for, for an NFL team. So he had to go and God knows what was left over when he came back. But, you know, it, it's a challenge. And you were getting into that industry because you actually entered the AV industry in 2011. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> it, it is. I, it is. I, I did my homework. You work for PSAV. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, you, you went and looked at my LinkedIn. So there may be some missing pieces there. Who knows? Uh-huh. I think actually my first job, I would say officially in AV that I, that I would say, tell the story would be 2008. Uh, it was about a year after I got married and I answered a Craigslist ad for an AV technician for a rental company in New Orleans. Um, Craig, Craigslist. I was, I was working at Guitar Center at the time and, uh, you know, no knock to Guitar Center, but I did not like my job at all. Uh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't want to sell guitar strings all day and guitar picks. Um, so, yeah, I answered a Craigslist ad that I saw looking for people who knew a little bit about sound and lighting and I knew a, a very little bit at the time. Um, and, yeah, I went and interviewed and started doing live events and basically did like three or four years at that company doing just like every weekend, every night running sound, something like that, setting up lights for weddings, a lot of the same thing over and over again. It was a lot of, I cut my teeth in AV in that world and then moved into more official working with PSAV and doing more of a technical director type role and kind of figuring out that I actually had a passion for it and kind of a knack for leading people and seeing the big picture when you're trying to put something together. So that was the beginning of it. I think 08 would be officially entered the AV world. Awesome. I mean, it's a great, it's a great story that you actually, uh, you know, have a, a, a path where you spent those times, you know, uh, you know, like you said, cutting your teeth or, you know, pulling the cable and doing the crap work. I mean, honestly, it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, not, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's not easy, especially the, the rental and staging side of the business because oh, your yeah. hours are all sorts of wacky. Oh yeah. Right? For a <laughs> early on in life. That's a great, opportunity but as you get older things will change and you know it's it's great to see that you had a hunger for something a little bit more than just hey there's my pyro hey there's the light let's start bobby's bar mitzvah right now Uh, cut let's go that is not going to work so you would you consider yourself i mean you went to college but are you more self-taught than you are you know uh would you i guess you would consider it more self-taught because you are a collector of knowledge. Uh, I do see, and I do know that you have no fear in attending classes and oh, passing yeah. these tests. Yeah. So absolutely. tell us about your path and how you went from, you know, being basically the cable jockey, right? Pulling the cable, setting up the lighting gear, doing that sort of stuff. How'd you get to where you are now? How does somebody, what was your path to yeah, pulling yeah. cable to senior designer? Yeah. Okay. Um, so like you, like I said, in 08, I entered that ad, that ad to uh, work for a rental company and that was really the beginning of it. And uh, so that was, you know, a very chaotic industry to jump into going from working, you know, day job at Guitar Center into just random events and, you know, the deadlines of live events being like five minutes and five hours from, you know, from idea to actual completion. That's, that chaos lasted for a while. And so, um, yeah, I think working for that rental company, I had a lot of freedom to learn. It was, um, it wasn't a big global company like PSAV is. So I kind of, you know, worked, it was a, you know, I worked right under the owner and, uh, they had a lot, they had a lot of business in New Orleans. There's obviously a lot of events and a lot of tourism in New Orleans. So we had a lot of opportunity to work a lot of weddings and, 
and just kind of work a lot of like side stages for festivals, things like that. And I really, um, I really put the hours in and, and had a lot of fun doing it, but obviously realized that uh, my passion for that was only going to go so far working for a company of that magnitude. And actually I didn't, I didn't leave that to go work for PSAV. I went to work for a company called Swank AV, which I don't know if you're familiar with Swank AV. Yes. They, were, they merged with PSAV about a year and a half after I joined them. Um, we had an opportunity. It was actually because of post Katrina because uh, Swank AV after Katrina hit was had a presence in New Orleans apparently, but left, um, dropped all their contracts and you know moved out of the state cause, or out of the city because New Orleans was kind of obliterated at the moment. Yeah. Tourism was down. Once that built back up, it was probably around 2011 um, when they re-entered the market and took over the Higher Regency New Orleans, and that was like a big fixture. The Higher Regency was a, a main hotel that was actually where like I think. Um, during the storm when Oprah was here with uh, Ray Nagin, our mayor at the time, uh, they shot out front of the Rahia Regency. That's where a lot of the images that you saw on the news and stuff were being shot where they were staying at in that hotel. So when that reopened, it was a really big, really big deal for New Orleans and Swank got the contract with it. So they were looking for somebody to come in. Um, and I really had a, it was a really cool opportunity because there weren't a lot of people here to work. Um, so they had some AB technicians and I was able to come in at the ground floor as a part-time technician, but really quickly become a full-time technician and then it really became evident to me that there was a lack of somebody who was willing to go the extra mile to, to learn the technical knowledge and to lead a team on large events. Because there, once the hotel opened, there was no shortage of companies who wanted to come to New Orleans for their corporate event. It was the hot thing at the moment. New Orleans is back up and running. Let's have our conference out there. So the Hyatt was just inundated with people coming to New Orleans to the convention center to the dome, which is right behind the Hyatt Regency. Mm -hmm. So I saw an opportunity really quickly that, um, you know, they need somebody here who's willing to put in the hours and learn and, and lead the team in these events. So there was a really great guy out of Texas that worked for Swank uh, that kind of became a mentor for me, um, mm -hmm. mentor's wing, and kind of just, you know, I, I trial by fire on a lot of really large events, and I found out that I actually had a knack for it. Um, you know, I do, I seem to think I do well under pressure. I, I like to, I like to do well under pressure. So that's what I liked about live events. Um, and that lasted for a while, a couple of years doing that. But I, my wife and I had one one kid at the time, our firstborn, uh, my oldest, who's almost ten, um, and we were about to have a second one. And I was working so many late hours and traveling here and there out to Arkansas and Texas and little one-off events. Uh, I decided that that wasn't really for me in the long term. Uh, I needed to find a better way to to, to use my brain and to um, kind of leverage that so I can have more time at home with the family, but still, you know, make a good income. And I. Uh, I, I think it was it was during my time at Swank and PSAV that I got introduced to 3D modeling and um, the mentor that I had was using SketchUp to do stage design for certain clients and I really took a liking to it. I got my first issue, you know, my first uh, access to AutoCAD at the time to help do 2D lighting plots and floor plans and stuff. So I started to realize that I really enjoyed the technical drafting and the creative modeling um, mm -hmm. that goes into event planning and to just yeah. design in general. And so I kind of ran with that and started to say, you know, this may be the path I want to go down. I want to go back to school and get a degree in AutoCAD, uh, find out where I can use this. And at the time, honestly, I didn't think I was going to use it in AV at all. I thought I was going to go to school and, get in CAD and join a different industry. I was going to go work in mechanics or, or um, who knows, like, I don't even know because I didn't even go down that far with it. I started yeah. going back to school. I did some night classes. I had two kids at the time, so I was working full time, went to school at night took some CAD classes. I got my chops up and I learned how to use the software really well. I had a few friends who kind of showed me some tricks and um, lo and behold, I was, uh, I was having dinner with some friends one night from, uh, from a church we all went to together. And this girl was, we were talking about what we do for a living. And I was just saying, you know, I do some 3d modeling and stuff. I'm dabbling in that, but I do AV. And she was like, Oh, my sister works for a company who's looking for a designer who can design technology and actually draft all the systems. And I, it was, like a, it was like a light bulb went off. I didn't know that that even existed. I hadn't even considered the fact that there was uh, install technology anywhere because I've been so used to just doing like roll it in a case, load it up, hang it from, hang the motors and lift it up and bring it back down and put it back in the cage. Like yeah, never permanent. The mentality I had, and I think a lot of people probably go through that and have the blinders on because you're so busy doing these things and learning these things. And uh, it was really, I think just kind of a, a great opportunity, right time, right place. Um, and that's when I reached out to IES, Interstate Electronics. And, you know, I've spent five years, you know, growing exponentially in my mind, I think. And uh, it's been a, a lot of fun.
it's it's been interesting watching how you've moved and, and, and actually grown in this because one of the things that Chase does for the people that are watching, if you if you don't follow him on Twitter, we will have his Twitter uh, thing show up on this lower third right here. Um, not only on the Twitter, but on his LinkedIn, you will see the work that he does. Uh, most recently, you had up an AR uh, conver- basically an, an AR modeling thing where you actually put a podium in the space. Um, what you said about CAD and 3D modeling uh, is so true and so um, so much in the vein of what AV was, right? I think AV has to change and has been changing over the, the their mindset of what engineering is. Uh, right. Almost to the point where your AV engineering skills and your 3D modeling are becoming more of a sales process, a sales tool, uh, where you're now creating those models as part of the sales package as opposed to the job's done. Here's what it's going to look like. Sign off for approval. Am I correct in saying that this is now even part of your early conception? This is why we need to win the job. And this is the difference between us and the other guys that it differentiate for Absolutely. you interstate. Absolutely. Yeah. We've seen that kind of naturally progress. That's, that's been a really cool opportunity here is that I kind of came into the company with that passion for 3d modeling, not, knowing if I'd have a way to use it at all. And, and, and early on the first year or two, you know, I, I was just stepping into integrated systems. So I had a lot to learn. I mean, you know, I didn't know most of the manufacturers that we use. I had no clue of what they actually sold or what they did and, that, and had a lot of learning period through that. Um, and eventually there were small opportunities that were like, okay, hey, maybe I can leverage some 3D modeling to kind of visualize what this will be or kind of really understand the projection light path here and see what we can do and what kind of ideas we can have. And that slowly progressed into, you know, well, I've got a model I'm already making. Let me get some tools to actually render it out and make an image that, you know, could be a sales tool. And we saw a value in that. And we've seen that a number of times now um, where we've done that on the front end. And that has been a key factor in us being selected to do a project um, is the care and time to go into that design process. All right, so I have to ask the dumb question in the room because there's people that are going to be watching this going, yeah, Chris, that's probably the dumbest question you've asked. But you are a fan of, obviously, you know, VR and AR and augmented reality and stuff like that. I need to hear it from an AV person. Did a game such as Pokemon Go change things in how you can present? I mean, the concept of... Mm you know, augmented reality in a, in a, in a real world, right? Yeah. For the most part, everything we've ever seen before was kind of just hokey, you know, in on a computer, people, it was kind of a, a placed Photoshop type thing. But here's the first time that you actually have a, a phone in your hand and, yeah. you know, you're seeing things through your phone. Um, did it change the way the thought process of augmented reality could be in a workspace? I, I would say, yeah, I think that it's a... Uh it changed things in the way that it made it accessible to so many people that may not have understood that that capability or that I, that idea even existed at all. So now, you know, everyone's kids and their parents, everyone understands they've heard something about Pokemon go or played it. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a little different because Pokemon go while it was augmented reality, like was a little bit too, two dimensional and it's just, which is, it was, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a great game. It was awesome. It was fun to play for a little while. It was a big fad. Saw tons of people everywhere doing it. Uh, my kids loved it. Um, but I think that, yeah, it, it started to open the door for people to understand that this technology is out there and that it has value um, when leveraged properly. So I think, and, and obviously that's, we're still in the absolute baby stages of that. Like that's oh, 100%, 100% agree with that. Super fledgling technology. It's been around for a while. People, other industries are using it in a, in a really great fashion. I went to, um, I forgot the, I think it's called distribute tech. Maybe what it was called. There was a, uh, power industry uh, conference here in New Orleans. That was so it's a co- national conference, but it happened to be in New Orleans hosted by energy um, probably about six or eight months ago. And I, I went just because I saw a couple of manufacturers like Christy and some other one plain R we're going to be showing there. It's like, okay, let me go and just, just for the heck of it, walk around and, and see what's going on out there. Maybe meet some people. And I did. And one of the cool things I saw was not so much augmented reality, but virtual reality. A couple of different companies were showing off how they're using that as a, as a, um, a training tool. And I, I kind of knew some other companies that were doing that, but they had some HTC Vive sets that were out and you could step up and you can actually work on a piece of machinery on a, on a, um, um, some generators and things like that. I forgot what it was, but you're actually grabbing virtual tools and moving it and seeing virtual reality in a really cool application that actually has some functional use. And so 
I kind of treat them both the same virtual reality and, and augmented reality. They have so much value and so much potential. And there's just, I'm really excited to see how that grows and the opportunities that we have to use it. That, that lectern that you saw was just a, like a, a just a proof of concept, basically like I, uh, you know, I've been making these models for a while and, and SketchUp has some native ability to do augmented reality. So that's what we used for that test was just a SketchUp app to throw it in the room and, and look at it and turn around and view it. Does, does, Augmented reality and virtual reality, as, as we were talking, does it have a place in AV? Uh, I say absolutely. Yeah, hands down. I mean, I, I don't know. It's not everything right now. I think that it's, you know, we have to be, I, I definitely have to be, um, we have to, you know, be cognizant of where we're using it at and what value it brings to the table. And it's not just a waste of time or just a, just for the, the flash, the it. because it's not for the sake of doing it. I don't think there's value in that at all. I mean, although it's fun for me to sit there and go down an 18 hour rabbit hole of how to do this exactly the way I'm thinking to do it or watch a million YouTube videos to do it right. Cause I, YouTube university is, you know, that's the college I really went to is YouTube university. I'm waiting on my degree. Uh, <laughs> but if, you know, I love doing that, but if it doesn't, if I don't really think it has value, then I'm not going to waste my time or anyone else's time doing it. But I, I absolutely think that it has value. And I think that's something that we're going to see develop over the next five to 10 years. That's going to be more and more prevalent. Uh, you, you see that, that technology being used specifically, at least I have, military applications have used uh, virtual reality and augmented reality uh, in, in training, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it in healthcare. I've seen that happen where people are using uh, AR and VR to train third world countries on how to do certain things as far even as, even, even as small as drawing blood. Um, the applications exist today. Um, mm -hmm. what, is, what is interesting about what you're saying also is that you're bringing that piece into the integrator shop, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a sellable thing, which is the first headache that people are going to have when they try to wrap their heads around AR and VR. How do we, how do we turn a profit? Well, right. you're not necessarily, com you know, commoditizing and putting it on a shelf and selling it. You're selling the service right. Right? and you're selling the application as a service you're providing, which is kudos to you guys for even going down that road and starting to introduce you know, a higher level of presentations because for the most part, most people will still do traditional. Here's your, here's your PowerPoint presentations. I know some people are, are getting into a higher level stuff. Uh, the, the stuff I've seen with Prezi is really cool as far as presentation wise for, for, for flow, uh, bringing in a, a 3d modeling virtual reality into your in-house and showing that as part of the sales package, I think is something that companies are overlooking right now or just, kind of scared off by the fact that it's going to, like you said, take, in, take you down a rabbit hole that you may not want to go. And it's not easy, I, I would assume. Exactly. And I think, I think the, what happens there, the companies that, at least my, my opinion, this is not fact-based, I guess it's just my, my opinion and thought on it, is that it, it happens at the companies where there's somebody there who has either a passion for it or a hobby in it and who's done something with it before and sees the value in it. And I think the most integrators would probably look at that if they've never, if they don't have anyone in the house that does it and maybe doesn't have an interest in doing it to, to bring that in and you know, that other people are doing it and there may be value in it. There's a lot of, a lot of fear and a lot of, a lot of maybe um, you may assume there's a lot of cost involved and a lot of time involved and there is. Um, but it, I think it really happens when you have people who naturally gravitate toward that type of technology and can bring it in house for you. And that just was what happened here. I think that's that paired up and, and I was able to find some value in using it here and, they've helped me develop it. So it's been great, a great partnership because they've been able to, you know, pay for new software and help develop and show it brings more value back to it. So it's a really good synergetic kind of relationship. Yeah. For the people that are listening that are, you know, young and want to go ahead and, 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 and do something different, listen to what Chase is saying. You're not going to get it day one, but if you show the value, right. And you kind of kick the tires off to the side and bring it back and show, Hey, we can do this. You will get, to a different level within your company just because you did that little extra work. And that's something that I can see you have done. Uh, the self, the, the self learning and stuff like that, that you've said, you've gone to YouTube university. That's where you're going to play. Honestly, I, yeah. you know, as a Gen X or I spend time on YouTube, I have to, because there's things that I absolutely don't know. And that's right. how I learn. <laughs> um, so let's go to formal AV education. What are some of the better classes that you've taken uh, that you would recommend? Like, what are, what are some of the classes that you went to, you got your certificate and it was really like either an eye opener or something that really changed how you thought of, of things? Okay. Um, 
obviously, um, I, I still see a lot of value and I saw a lot of value at the time in pursuing the Avixa CTSD. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, you know, right when I started with this company, I actually, um, they had just, I think I started around Christmas time five years ago and they had just had a company meeting right before that and they were pushing for everyone to get CTS certified. And I think they had done that and probably true of a lot of companies. They had tried to make that push for everyone a few times and it just never really took hold. There was mm -hmm. projects getting in the way and people get distracted. It takes a lot of self time, self learning at home off hours. So people don't get committed to it. And so I kind of took that right when I came in, I'm like, Oh, well, there's an opportunity. So I went and got my CTS first as the new guy at the company to kind of help jumpstart that and then went down the CTSD road, um, which took me about a year, year and a half to really prepare for the CTSD. Um, and uh, after that, um, you know, I, you, you can see on my LinkedIn, I, like I, anytime there's a manufacturer that we use that has some sort of training or certification, I will absolutely spend the time at home watching the videos or while I'm running on a treadmill to just to soak in that knowledge so I feel confident in what I'm doing and, and, and feel better at what I'm doing. But I would say the most valuable the most valuable um, entity that I've been a part of and that in the course of that I've taken have been part of SynodCon um, under Pat, Pat and Brenda Brown. I think that, uh, and I had heard the name years ago uh, and never really followed through with it. Um, but I think that we focus, we focus a lot around video and control in our industry um, and audio is, you know, it's always there. We always do it kind of thing, but the education side of audio and acoustics um, is so intricate and so it feels so unpredictable to people, but it's also so predictable sometimes it's when you science. The science. And I think that I really enjoy understanding that more. I will never claim that I know enough or, or even a lot. Um, but I'm, and I'm always learning it, but I would say that uh, I did a, I think it was last year, about a year ago, I went out to Pennsylvania. Uh, there was a, they, they hosted it at a college out there that had a really awesome performance space um, and Pat and Brenda did a class. It was a three-day course, and it was kind of a design-centric course for audio. Um, and that I think I walked away from that with the feeling the most fulfilled of what I learned in a three-day period. Also, with you know the most my my brain hurt the most than it ever did from going to a three-day course as well, which is what I want. Like I want the mush. thing you want mush. <laughs> me and make me hurt and make me come back to it. That's that that's how I learn. And so I really enjoy when the when the material is not surface level. And so you know, not to knock things that are out there, but there are a lot of surface level training courses that are in our industry. And so that's one thing that I personally wanted, you know, to see develop more and more. And I think some manufacturers are absolutely doing that. And I love to see it, that they are challenging and they're in their, um, the rigor that's involved with their training courses they put out are, are much deeper. Um, the same thing actually uh, to pair with the Synodcon thing, I decided about a year ago that um, personally I need to find a way to get a much deeper knowledge on networking, which most everyone in our industry knows is ha they have to do. Um, yeah. And everyone's taking their own route to do it. And there's some manufacturers in our industry that are putting out good coursework for it. But I went the other way and I said, well, if I was a computer science person and I had to learn networking, where would I go? Uh, and I found a website called cybrary.it and I've tweeted it out a couple times. Um, mm -hmm. And they, you know, they're, they're kind of like a large entity that hosts a multitude of different training platforms for different industry certifications for IT and networking yeah. and computer science. But CompTIA was the, you know, seemed to me to be the Avixa of that industry. So I kind of gravitated and said, okay, CompTIA, it looks like Network Plus is the certification that you need a baseline get. So I started the training material for that. And I'll tell you, I'm still in the middle of it. I've chewed it off little bits here and there, but I'm probably about 40 man hours into it. And I'm only about a, a half the way maybe through the videos and the training of things that I've learned, which have been, really helpful to my understanding of, of networking, but also they show me how much there is, how much there is to know about it. And it really gave me an, um, a perspective on how surface level some of the networking training courses we have within our industry, how, how much lacking they are. I think we get that little bit and almost, it almost to me feels like it's a false sense of confidence for people. And I hope that, that it, we find a way to, to grow that even more and have our industry content to be, to go even deeper and potentially even, you know, push people towards CompTIA Network Plus or more of the computer science entities. Awesome, man. Um, we'll, we'll also share those links uh, on, the, on the lower thirds and do all that stuff. So going back to the beginning of this conversation, uh, we've met online and we've been Twitter buddies and LinkedIn buddies for a long time. But uh, I guess my, my question is, what has the internet done for Chase McCloud? Uh, <laughs> aside from what you've learned, because you're an online learner. 
right? Uh, yeah. People catch a lot of flack for being social and you are social. You share your work, right? Where some may pull that back. You know, old school mindset AV will tell you, you got a secret, don't share it. Don't yeah. show people that we do yeah. augmented reality. Oh God, you yeah. know, let's, let's yeah. not go there. So what has, how has AV yeah. and internet kind of collided and has that improved the AV experience for you? For me personally, I mean, number one, Twitter community has been phenomenal. Um, meeting everybody. I think from my first Infocom, I think this last, this past year was my fifth Infocom in a row. <laughs> the first one I went to in Orlando, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I was the only one from my company that went, uh, and I was literally by myself for <laughs> three or four days in Orlando. Um, and it was a little boring. I mean, the show itself was awesome, but mm -hmm. after that, it was kind of boring because I didn't know anybody. So the Twitter community has been absolutely amazing. It's been really helpful in certain certain aspects. I've asked technical things. And, um, you know, obviously, the internet being so accessible for information, um, it's it's been a, it's grown me tons. I would say without access to other people's content online, um, I would be a small fraction of the way that I of, of where I am now and what I've learned and, and the things that I've attempted to try because of the support of people online. So I think that it's it's paramount to my growth uh, and to other people's growth as well. So um, and a lot of what I've seen, I I, I kind of I, I hobbyist in. Uh, and computer coding and uh you know that's been something that's like the last year or so i saw you know just like i did with networking just like i did with 3d modeling and augmented reality stuff i saw a lot of value in being an av person who understood more maybe not that i'd be doing it on every day but that i understood to a very granular level how computer how computers work in general but how computer code is generated in different languages and what the computer industry is using and what av can be leveraging and so that led me down the path of taking a bunch of coursework now in JavaScript and CSS and HTML and Python and Lua and, and uh, SQL and C Sharp, all these languages that I'm, you know, doing little bits and chunks of here and there. But I tell you the online community and the online resources, it would be impossible for me. And I would never even attempt it if I didn't have that available to me. Um, and I think that we see a lot more, uh, a lot more people that are, have the ability to, to find their niche and to learn things really quickly with boot camps and online online uh, coursework that you know would have spent their you know the traditional way of four to eight years of college before and not being sure the whole way through if that's what they really wanted to do and they're committing all this money and time and I'm super grateful that you know that this this internet exists. Okay. This, enough, one. enough. The one thing you're not saying, which you are, you <laughs> become a very proficient networker, man. You know how to talk to people and you have no fear in asking people questions, which that sets you apart than some other people who can do the things you do. All right. Not just from a, Hey man, Chase McLeod knows what he's doing and he's got all these awards and stuff like that. But I've gotten DMS from you asking questions where I'm like, why is he asking me? You know, <laughs> but I, I have no problem sharing the information either. But yeah. That is what the true heart of everything uh, that is being done on the internet, for the most part, is that that community has been a game changer for me. I'm sure it's added a lot to you as well because you're right. Yeah. I think I, I think I was one of the first people to meet you in Orlando outside of a Drunk Uncles concert. I think you were. You and Melissa. You and Melissa Stillman. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am, full circle. I'm working with Melissa, and now here I am talking <laughs> to you. There That's you go. So yeah, we you know it, it was a um, it, it was a different game changer for me. My first Infocom was the same thing. I went out as an end user. Mm -hmm. I had one or two uh, integrators that I worked with that saw me and were like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna tag along? You wanna come out and whatever?" Mm -hmm. I went to like one or two events and back to my room, and that was Infocom. I'm like, "Well, I love the geek out, right? The, the right. Whole, that's why I'm there." I'm like, "Whoa, right. look at that! Look at this!" Right. I think there's more that can be done as far as, you know, um, adding a little bit of that experience into the show. I think we have a, a ways to go with there, but I think we're <clears throat> yeah. there. I admitted it for the Vixa. If you're listening, I would <laughs> finally admitted that we're kind of going down that right path because it's taken a while for me to say that. Yeah. But, um, you know, you got us as a, as a trade association. They got us because most of us are, are going to be nerds. We're going to want to see the geeky stuff. We want to see projectors with 
coolers and engines and exhaust fans because the more horsepower, the better, you know, on a projector or an LED wall that's bigger than the side of a building. And right. cheaper. We got to go down the air road too. So a lot of cool products. And do you consider yourself a geek at core? You know, the core of Chase McLeod. Is it somebody who will walk into a place and can't take his eyes off that bad projector or that can't sit in a room because the sound is off? Or are you that hardcore when it comes to that stuff? I, yeah, I think it depends on what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I would 100% be lying if I said I wasn't a geek. Uh, yeah. I geek out on very specific things I think um, I'm not the type of person I will say that uh, that will you know walk up and leave if the if the sound is terrible I will comment on it absolutely I will tell my wife next to me or anybody who's next to me that something's not right uh, but I will yeah. meanwhile I'm you're not, on stage crying because daddy just got got up and left because he can't handle the lighting in this room I can't right exactly yeah, like just like <laughs> some people, some people who are audiophiles and and video files, hide it. You know, they they care so much about having the latest and greatest 4K TV because mm -hmm. in your house. I don't. I have a 10 year old 40 inch Vizio TV in my living room, and it still works. And I'm not changing it, and I don't have a soundbar under it because it's fine for me. I don't care. I love figuring out a solution for somebody who doesn't want that and wants something better and the more efficient way to do it. I care about helping other people design that stuff and figuring out, you know, how to stretch myself to do it for other people. It's not necessarily for me. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I spend that time, but I do geek out on other things. I mean, I, when I, when I would rather sit down and I think the last thing I went to out of town was probably Crestron masters. And, uh, I went there and there was like a big event at night, whatever I, I, at the time I was doing a bunch of HTML and CSS and JavaScript online videos and stuff. And I spent most of my time, after class, going straight back to my room and working on a test web page that I was building because that's, I was like focused on, I want to do just this right now. This is all I care about. And I find myself doing that more and more where I, you know, I, I jump to different things a lot. I like to change it up so I don't get stagnant with one thing because once I spend too much time, you know, six days straight watching two hour videos in the morning of this one subject, you get burnt out on it really quickly. So I like to jump around, go back and forth. And so, you know, um, that's how I stay fresh with it. But yeah, cool. I don't know question at all. I don't <laughs> it, it, it works. So let's, uh, let's jump into some, uh, s some, some dumb questions because that's what the, the people are here for. And by the way, I took a picture once of my TV at home and there was the tiniest little wire hanging out of it. It's because Did everyone freak out on you. Yeah. 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 I, it was, it, it was a little NES that I just connected the HDMI to the side. I wasn't taking apart the sound system. Oh man. It was just my son's like, hey, dad, can we put the uh, little NES box? And those were that box was hard to find. I finally got one. Everybody else was paying like hundreds of dollars for this for this NES. Game. Yeah. Was, the little NES simulator. Yeah, the simulator. I found one. I got one at cost. I'm like out the door. Let's go. Let's get it home. Rip it open. Start playing punch out. Take a picture. Next thing I know, I'm catching crap for having an HDMI cable. Thank you, Victoria Ferrari. For letting me know, I had to take down the picture. This is bad. I'm embarrassed. I'm a pro. She's like, you call yourself a pro? I'm like, held to a higher I'm standard, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Tough crowd, man. I and really? don't get me wrong. I love Victoria. Victoria's a great person. She called yeah. me right out. Didn't even wait a minute. She called me right out. The, the she may be short in stature, but damn, dude, she packs a punch when it yeah, when it comes to. Things, that's one of the things you love about her is that she's not. <laughs> Absolutely, hundred percent. So let's uh, let let's get into some some questions here. Okay. Um, the first one <clears throat> I need to ask. Uh, I'm dumb. I have only been to New Orleans once, right? Okay. Um, what what is your definition of a low country boil? What? I would. I mean, I'm gonna make some assumptions here. Uh, I will say this. Yeah, I've grown up in New Orleans. I've never heard a low country boil in my life. Get uh, out! We, really? We, we boil all the time. You did you hear that? Like, you must have heard that west of here, more Lake Charles Lafayette kind of area. Yeah, maybe. Uh, okay, there's, there's, from what I understand, tell me if I'm wrong and if this does exist. Right? right? If this does exist, you take your crawfish, you take potatoes and corn, and you throw them in a in a in a pot. You let the yeah. thing bubble over, and you toss oh, it on yeah. some newspaper. Oh yeah. 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 That, I mean, that's a, that's a boil. Yeah. That's a boil. That's a boil. Okay. 
All right, so I added extra words through you completely. Oh, yeah, no, you got, you got me with a low country deal. I'm like, okay. okay, maybe you just mean because everything's a swamp and it's sinking, it's low country. I'm like, <laughs> Go ahead. So, so, tell, tell, so give me what a boil is. So a boil is, it's just that. I mean, literally, it's the staples are, um, you know, sausage, corn, potatoes. You have to have those three. It is heavy, heavy seasoning, cayenne. Uh, there's some companies here, Zatarans and Louisiana seasoning that makes some pre-made seasonings that we, I would swear by, I, I, even being from here, I think they're phenomenal. It's garlic, you know, lots of heads of garlic. And you throw them all in a pot, just like you said, onions. I do some oranges in there, cut in half, and you boil it um, until it's done. Let it soak. The soak is extremely important to get the meat to soak up the flavor correctly. And you pour it out on the table, cover it in a newspaper, and you eat it all. So lots of crawfish, lots of shrimp, lots of crabs. Uh, when there's when they're out of season, sometimes we will boil just the fixins, basically everything else except for the protein. Uh, <laughs> sausage, though, just because you want it so bad. But most of the time, like year round, uh, I will boil shrimp. You know, like once a month or something like that, just because I need to have a boil and I love to try and perfect. Shrimp is way harder to boil and do right than it is crawfish. You can you can do crawfish uh, and get it right, or at least get it close. Easy, get the meat out of the shell close. It, the hard part is getting the meat out of the shell and doing it right. So. Uh, I boil shrimp a multitude of times a year just to try to get better at it. <laughs> All right. So I, I, because now I'm fascinated by Louisiana food, what is your favorite New Orleans or Cajun cuisine? Um, and I'm going to follow that up with what is your recommendation for somebody listening to this who is going to New Orleans? I don't want no fancy place. I want the little corner shop. I'm going to be completely honest here, and you're probably not going to like my answer. Oh, um, please don't say pizza. Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, no. My answer is actually, I never give recommendations to people when they come to New Orleans because I've been raised on food at home. Like when you go to, I don't recommend a place to go get boiled crawfish or boiled shrimp or anything like that because Make it at home. we cook it at home. Like you've grown up eating everything. Your family can, my, you know, my father-in-law mm -hmm. could cook like crazy. My mom, my mm -hmm. family, they cook gumbo is always made at home. I don't order gumbo at a restaurant. I eat my mom's gumbo because it's yeah. so good. So I don't have a place. I mean, that I would recommend. My favorite, probably my favorite like Cajun staple though, is just boudin sausage. I don't know if you've ever had boudin before. No, what's that? It's like a pork, rice, spicy seasoned sausage. So it's ma mainly rice, but it's mixed up with ground pork and seasoning and stuff and they shove it in a casing and they boil it. You can boil it, steam it, grill it. I like to grill it, um, but you can get it all over the place and it's absolutely delicious. All right, so, so. Is, is, is alligator a thing there? Uh, it's a touristy thing, I think. Uh, you get it, you get <laughs> it on a stay stick. Stay away from the alligator is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, you could try it if you want to say you went to New Orleans and had alligator on a stick or fried alligator tails or something like that. But no, I don't. I personally don't go buy alligator meat. You can get it at the shops and stuff, the Cajun meat uh, shops. But I've had I'm it before. Not down with no alligators, dude. Not, not even in, in person. I don't yeah. leave them alone. You, you <laughs> hang out in the swamp or something. Yeah, from, from a meat perspective. <laughs> I mean, it tastes like chicken or rabbit or something like that. But. You just did not. You did not go there. You just right. called it taste like chicken? Yeah, Come of course. On, <laughs> it's a white meat from a tail. You can't. <laughs> I mean, once it's deep fried and battered, it all tastes the same. So what is it? You know what? I'm discovering that in the South, anything is yeah, deep right. fried and battered. It seems like. cook things in clean oil down here, it seems like. So, you know, it tastes like. <laughs> that oil. holds the flavor, dude. It yeah. holds the flavor. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, how many miles do you run a day? Because I've heard conflicting reports. Oh, yeah? Who's reporting that? I <laughs> <laughs> Who's reporting that? Right. I'm hearing you do 5K in the morning and then maybe another 5 in the afternoon or at night. That, Is that even remotely possible? That's a rare thing, but I, I'd say that that happens once a year maybe. I pretty much do a 5K between three to four to four and a half miles, four to five days a week in the morning. That's my, I get up at 4.55 ish in the morning throughout the week, even on the weekends and I'll go to the gym. And that's when I get my time to, to run, get my exercise, but also to soak in whatever training stuff I'm trying to do. If I'm watching videos or doing things on an app for coding or something like that, like I'll sit on the treadmill or something like that. I'll run on the treadmill in the gym and be able to use that time to watch videos and kind of, you know, multi multitask there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but do you lift bro? I mean, oh, no, 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 like I mentioned earlier, I, I went through a weight loss period before my wedding about 12 years ago where I lost 80 pounds in three months. And that was 100% due to eating turkey slices and drinking water 
every day for three days a meal, three day, you know, three meals a day. And I ran five, five miles a day for six days a week. And so over a three month period, I dropped 80. I mean, you could think you're like, you're taking in basically no calories and burning yeah. off. A ton. And yeah, that's a really good I was, I was 20 at the time. Uh, I'm 33 now. I, and I have a fourth kid on the way in five weeks. So I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I, I wish I could, but I can't run that. I can't do that much anymore. You said 455 ish. I, I can't do 455 ish. You oh, know, yeah. like <laughs> the morning, and I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go run three miles. Yeah, I'm a morning you person. You do work, right? You know, this is not just a hoax. <laughs> no, man. Yeah, I, I get up, go to the gym, come back home, cook breakfast for everybody, get a shower, and go to the office. Damn. That's, that's my commitment. routine. Well, not only are you showing a commitment to your to obviously to to the training, are you participating in the 5K? next year in Las Vegas. Cause I wouldn't even want to see people running in Orlando, <laughs> let alone. I'll definitely do it next year. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, well, I will put the money on you then. Thank you, Chase. <laughs> I, I have other questions, but you've left me startled. I can't talk about any other, <laughs> you know, uh, food questions. Cause now I think I need to go run a mile or walk. Oh, up. Not at all, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate the time, the effort and, uh, like I said, getting to know you and getting to know your story about how you came up through the industry and how you're currently working in the space, whether you are, you know, starting off as a uh, event tech guy and now look at what you're doing now. It's a great story. I appreciate you coming on. Kudos to Interstate for seeing that in you and allowing you the ability to go out and play with toys and bring it back as a value to not only um, to you who wants to learn it, but to your customers. That's awesome. I commend both you and them for doing that. Uh, if we wanted to find out more about interstate electronic systems, where can we find out more? Uh, we are IES-LLC.com. Say that again? IES-LLC.com. And where can we find you on Twitter? Oh, you can find me at Chase McLeod at Chase McLeod. And you have LinkedIn. Is there anything else? Do, do, do we go find the MySpace or are you out of that? You and Tom not Oh, anymore? you'll find me on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you'll probably find um, some old songs. <laughs> you don't want to go look at a MySpace at all. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Unless you're Justin Timberlake. I think he, he bought into it a couple of years ago thinking it was going to run. Oh, something. Terrible idea. But hey, terrible that's idea. my second Justin Timberlake reference in, 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 in a podcast. I'm pretty much done with that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm completely done with that. Um, so thank you again for, for coming on. Thank you for telling us your story. It's a great story, Chase. And uh, I look forward to seeing you over at Infocom in, uh, in Vegas. And if not, if I don't see you sooner, because, uh, my travels sometimes will collide with yours. And you have been up in the Northeast region where we uh, uh, don't eat alligator and uh, we try to avoid the touristy spots as well. So uh, I'd be happy to help you when you uh, head up my way. Yeah, we'll Ladies and gentlemen, to this is, we'll go ahead. We'll go to Bubba Gum Shrimp together over in Times Square. That's, that's totally local. <laughs> because local. nothing is more New Orleans like Bubba Gum. <laughs> That's the one thing we don't have in, in Jersey that's very good is, is, is Cajun food, for that matter. Uh, we do have soul food, but not Cajun food. And those are two different, two different types of food. And I do love asking the food questions because the food questions get into, you know, I've, I've had some people like, dude, I don't, that's all I do is talk about food. That's all I want to do is eat. You know, I'm, I'm a fat kid from Jersey. This is what happens. You know, I, I got to know the spots. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much again for coming by. My name is Chris Netto. This has been Rebels in Flux. You can find me on Twitter, Chris underscore Netto. Check out our sponsor, Starin.biz. Uh, they're right here on this lower third. That's where you want to go to check out where I work and who is the sponsor of this uh, podcast. I will also say that you can check out Synergy Center. Dot com synergy hyphen center.com that is where the rebels and flux podcast lives on the internet and we do have a youtube channel uh as well which is uh Starin info uh thank you again everybody for listening thank you chase mcleod for joining us and telling us your great story and i look forward to seeing you guys in the next episodes of rebels and flux my name's chris netto thank you so much for listening thank you so much for watching this has been rebels and flux <laughs> Let's <laughs> go.